There's a yeah. there's a great film you should check out called World on a Wire. Du eins, Herr. Ob, Herr Ob. Ich wäre Ihnen dankbar, wenn Sie Ihren Lesern gelegentlich den Unterschied zwischen einem Computer und unserem Simulationsmodell nahebringen würden. Es handelt sich um eine völlig neue Generation in der Computertechnologie. Und wem nützt sie? Uns allen, wenn es nach mir geht. Ich wäre mich wirklich sehr für Simulacrum. Stimmt das, dass Sie damit eine künstliche Welt gebaut haben? Die Welt ist ein bisschen übertrieben. It's based on a French science fiction from the 60s. And the storyline is there's a guy who's invented a supercomputer. Uh, and what they've done is it, they've built, uh, built a little reality in it of a, of a, of a town, a city. Mm -hmm. And they can predict what's going to happen in the outside world from it. So big companies want to use it so that they can make money because this thing can predict stuff, right? Mm -hmm. The guy that's invented it one day, he dies in the computer room and they don't know why. And so his assistant takes over, right? But you can go into the, you can go into this reality as an avatar and speak to the people in it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he goes in and he ends up having a conversation with this guy that they've got in there. He's their man on the inside. And this guy said, I want you to take me up to, to, to your level. You know, I want to come to your level. And he said, you can't do that. He said, I want to do it. You can't. A couple of days later, somebody else from the company goes in. In a, and this guy tricks them and our level yeah the other guy then meets him and they fight they have a really long fight and he, mm. he gets the guy down eventually said why did you do this why did you come here he said well i need to get here so i can get to the reality mm -hmm. he said you're in a program as well but you don't know it the reality is mm. up there right and what he does eventually he gets rid of this guy but he he eventually gets swapped into the real reality above it so it's the also, idea is that where we are is is a simulation, but it's still an odd, it, you know. Is that film? I, I have uh, questions about everything. I always have questions about. Isn't there a film with Leonardo DiCaprio about a, a concept like that? It, uh, it came up. Uh, Inception, but that's about Inception. dreams within dreams. Now, this is another one, but dreams. That's about dreams within dreams. But that's interesting. I have no. had a dream within a dream. I've woken up from a dream and still been in a dream. Every time I, I, I realize I'm in a dream, you know, when you have that, that moment when you realize you're in a mm -hmm. dream and then you instantly think, oh, fuck it, let me turn it into a sex dream. But, and then as soon as I try and do that, I wake up. <laughs> That's... I don't know why it is. It's, all, it's almost like... It's, it's, it's like, it's, it's like my, it's that my, sounds like my life. That's my life, Tommy. <laughs> It's that, it's like my subconscious is like saying no. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna allow you to have a lucid dream no, no. like that. If you want to have, have a lucid is, dream, keep it wholesome. That's very lucid, isn't it? For you, Tommy, the bank is over. I was waiting yeah. to use that line. Yep. Um, yeah. Well, it the wouldn't, it wouldn't be lucid a wank, dreaming be... is when, but when you when you wait, it, <laughs> if she doesn't want to know you, it might be when you. The problem with the lucid dream is once you realise that that's where you are. That's normally because, you know, lucid dreams happen at the end of REM sleep. So it's just on that borderline of consciousness. Right, That's right. when they happen. And so when you realize that, it's then it's very hard to stay in the dream. That's mm. what happens. That's what's happening to you. Once you realize it, you've got sometimes you've got to try and I've got to stay in it. I've had some like that. They're that amazing. I used to write them down. I wrote down all the ones where there was a proper interaction and I remembered it clearly. Mm hmm. And I did have some really crazy things, but they were interesting, you know. And but those dreams do occur in a very short space of time. So in Inception, the idea is that an hour in in a dream is only a couple of minutes in reality, and that is the case. 
I had a lucid dream once where I was climbing down the banks of a, a canyon to try and watch a U2 gig, right? But the dream I wrote down, the stuff I wrote down was about a half an hour experience. You know? mm-hmm. So, you know, Bono, eh? Uh, but, yeah, those kind of things are very interesting. All those kind of little synchronicity things and knowing that somebody's going to phone. I mean, the other one I was telling somebody recently was, you might know it because you, have you ever done any busking in London? The organised ones, a, li- the tube a little bit, a little bit, not too much. So you know, Tottenham Court Road, where they remodelled it, they took one of the old service tunnels and they turned it into a walkway. So it's really big, like a train tunnel, but it's all white tiles. And they got a spot for a bus. And we were in there one evening with some friends of mine from Brazil, walking along, and the guy was he had a rock guitar, really cool he was, and he was playing Parisian walkways, Gary Moore, right? Mm-hmm. Nice tune. And I said to my friend, oh, because he's a big rock fan, let's have a listen to him for a minute. And then he finished. Oh, cool, little whatever. I said to my friend, so what do you think he's going to play next? He's like, I don't know. I said, well, have a guess. And he guessed some deep purple or something. And I looked at the guy. I said, no, he's going to play comfortably numb. And he started playing these chords. And my friend looked at me and he's like, we should go now. Because <laughs> he started playing comfortably numb. Hmm. Right? I don't no. know. How do I know that he's going to, I'm not looking at his list or, you know. And then... The same people, we went to a pub where there was a singer-songwriter guy, but he, he was doing requests. He had like a 400 list of songs, mm-hmm. different artists, yeah? So you could go on your phone, you could do a thing, and you could actually say, can you play such and such, right? He only had two tracks by the Beatles. But about an hour later, I knew he was going to play a Beatles song. And I said, I was going to say to my friend, he's going to play Beatles. And he played mm-hmm. Ticket to Ride. And that would have scared the living mm-hmm. crap out of these. Then... I go further than that. My Irish friend, who's a singer songwriter, came here to the Spice of Life, if you've ever played there. Yeah, yeah. Down in oh, right. He played down there. There was a few other bands, and we were chatting afterwards, and they play the DJ, play music. And I was explaining this to him. And as I, after I'd explained it to him, I said, yeah, and then obviously you think about Bowie. And as I said it, they st- it started playing um, all the young dudes, hmm. right? Started playing on the thing. And he looked at me. I said, don't worry. It's normal now. It's normal. You know, you start attracting this odd stuff with music. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. You know? Yeah. It's fascinating. I, and I, I love, uh, I love looking into all that because it, it, you know, when you realize there is some, like something that's bigger than you, I'm not, I'm not going to, I'm not going to call it God, but uh, you know, when you realize that there's some kind of thing that's, going on, that's, that's, that's every bloke in a pub. Isn't it? <laughs> yeah. But, um, you, 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 I mean, anyway, I'm, yeah um yeah when when you when i when i kind of uh it's almost some, something magical about all that stuff and, and it makes your normal everyday problems uh you think well they're not as important there's something there's something bigger that's why i, I like i like thinking about that yeah, stuff. yeah it, it, yeah like i say we did the, that's the it's been said before the problem with stuff like that is people put words on it it's again robert anton wilson i don't know where he got it from it's the problem with humans is you put words on things and you argue about the words. Yeah, which yeah, is what's yeah. happening to you on Facebook about, about this and whatever. You argue about the words. So if you say God to someone, they immediately have an image of an old man in a dress with a beard in the sky. Because mm. you know. that's what God is. Isn't it? That's what mm. that's what all the paintings are. Or mm. well, Jesus is a white dude. Probably not. Mm. There's pictures. There's, there's a painting somebody put up recently, The Last Supper, and they're all black. Mm. Like the one thing I don't understand is is really I know I, I I get it a little bit but I don't really understand Black Lives Matter. Uh, so do do you know much about that organisation and like the history behind it? Well, it's it, they were started in America as an organisation about five years ago. Like a lot of these things, somebody funded them. The odd thing about the "I can't breathe" phrase is it was started when a, a, this, you can see a video of it. A very large black gentleman on the streets of New York was accused of selling cigarettes illegally. And these mixed police, plain clothes or white tops, whatever you got with the hat and thing, whatever in America, they did their aggressive thing and they got him on the floor. And one of them held him down and he he, choked, he, he suffocated. Yeah. He died. Genuinely, mm-hmm. he was genuinely killed by the police. Yeah. And he was saying, I can't breathe, I can't breathe. Good evening. For the second time in as many weeks, a grand jury has found the evidence is just not there to charge a white police officer in connection with the death of a black civilian. This time, it's in the biggest city in the nation, packed with tourists for the holiday season. 
These cases are wildly different and half a nation apart. This one involves the video seen around the world by now showing a man named Eric Garner being taken down by mostly plainclothes police officers while being placed under arrest. One of the officers employed a chokehold. Moments later, while on the ground after complaining he couldn't breathe, he was dead. Well, tonight, while so far peaceful, there are protesters in the streets of New York City, some of them, as you see, within about a block of the Rockefeller Center Christmas tree, which gets lit up a short time from now. And again, the streets already packed with visitors. Our coverage begins where this story started, NBC's Stephanie Gosk in New York City. And so that was this big thing where that kind of stuff used to happen, for sure. That's, it's a very, you know, it's a known thing cops you know well wherever wherever you go you're going to get some dodgy nonsense like that you know ask anybody in london from a certain era from my era from way back what how that was and how police treated people that they, they know that so this organization started but it's a political organization it's not about helping black people it, it had been around for a few years prior to the, the george floyd incident though hadn't uh, yeah, yeah about five years it's called black lives matter inc i believe so it's an incorporated business ish um and the the three women that started it were as the woman said in her interview that patrice colors about a year ago they were all trained marxists so they're trained to do something else right. and marxism doesn't care about people's skin color it cares about having power this is so what what is marxism because I, I i i in my head i just think it's kind of like communism but i don't, I don't really understand what it is i've never really read into it it's the heaviest i think it's the heaviest form of communism is it where they take everything from everybody and the state owns everything and dictates everything to you yeah. that's why communism f was so bad in places like russia because if you take everything away from people and you say to everyone you're going to be this job and you're going to do that job and you're going to get this much money and you know there's only one make of washing machine and only one make of tv and you've got no choice and the food's crap then you don't put any effort in that's meant to be the argument for uh, pro real proper capitalism rather than corrupt capitalism is that people have the incentive if you work hard and do well you can you can have a better standard of living mm -hmm. yeah? so that's then to be the argument but the, the socialist one is to take everything away from people and that's what they're aiming for mm -hmm. that's what they want to do with this food thing and they're supposed to be trying to make you know they want to make meat illegal yeah mm -hmm. so that you have the farm stuff or whatever and then they want to Get, you know, they're aiming, why are they doing football grounds and gigs and all that? They want to kill all of that. They don't want people to have joy in their lives mm -hmm. at all. You know? mm -hmm. And that's, that's, so that's where that comes from. And then th this organization had kept going. And then, of course, the George Floyd thing happens. And even I thought, this is too odd. Why is this happening now, you know? And then when you actually see the, the body cam footage from the policeman, you realize that this, you're, what you were told two months ago it's not the story it's not the story if you haven't seen the body cam footage from the cop the full 15 minutes or whatever it is mm -hmm. then you understand what's going on you know the end of it after that whether that's a psyop or not i don't know because there's loads of other i've forgotten the guy's name there was a wonderful jamaican guy who's in america does conspiracy videos and he's all about freemasonry and and duping delight and them tricking you and stuff and he's great when you hear that guy's voice and he's like that's like yeah this is such and such and this is you know that's a trick this is a trick they're fooling you and you know so this event happens and then suddenly this it becomes this other thing of defund the police well they want to get rid of the police so they can have their either you know private police forces or robots you know and they've been telling you that in films for years started with robocop mm -hmm. yeah had it in terminator had it in um chappie yeah. All the electric, all the robot police going around beating people up. It's in um, Elysium as well. There's a great, great, the great portrayal in Elysium of the robot cops that beat people up. You know? Of course, they want to get rid of the police. If you can have a machine that's 24 seven and isn't corrupt and does exactly what you say, go and kill that one there. Mm. Of course, you, of course, you're going to control the population. Why would so, you want to get rid of these? You know? So, are you, uh, but Black Lives Matter. Um, the, the reason it confuses me is because it it's just it, what is 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 that was that created specifically to cause like uh, political um, be able to have these like political moves, or was there some like truth it's, to the actual? It's, it's, it's certainly a divisive thing, and that stirs up trouble. And if but, you get the, enough people who feel who feel aggrieved, right, their message to black people is all black people are victims. And that's not the case, you know. 
But the idea is if you don't think you're a victim, you're stronger than yourself. If you think you're a victim, then it's all, there's always somebody else to blame for your failings or problems. All right. So at the moment, it, it's 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 whiteness is the problem, isn't it? Or it's men, you know, or straight men, you know. But, but, they, but BLM has never they've never cared about the people they say they cared about. The riots that they that they instigated co- caused untold damage to black businesses. Mm-hmm. You know, people worked really hard, lost everything. And you're like, well, where's you? Why are you? Why aren't you putting money into the community? And then when this woman turns out that she owns four houses. You know, who's that? The, who's that? The founder of Black, black Lives Matter? Patrice, Patrice Colors. I mean, the name is a joke. It has to be right. Colors. Her name is Colors. Oh, really? <laughs> she's, like, she's, really, the found, you know, she's the founder of BLM. One of the founders, yeah, yeah. So did, you, uh, the most recent house is the, the one that got her in trouble because she bought she bought a ranch house with a with a with a guest house for one point four million dollars in a predominantly white rich neighborhood for her and her girlfriend. Right, but she's telling black people they got it hard. You're oppressed. We're oppressed. If you're oppressed and you can buy a one million dollar house, you're four. One million dollar house. You ain't oppressed. And, uh, you are not oppressed. And that's it's like Oprah Winfrey when she interviews Harry and Meghan. She's a billionaire. Mm. She is a billionaire. Mm. You know. So, so but, we used to be friends with a guy called John of God, but that's another story too. Is the is the is the founder of BLM though? Do they have any good intentions? Or are you saying they're just kind of post? No, I don't. I don't think they did. I don't think they did because they would have done something good. They would have done something good. It's like all these organisations. If you a lot of a lot of people in the gay community now are, are really um, unhappy with Stonewall. Stonewall started to get rights for gay people and to stop them getting beaten up in the street. Yeah, and now that that's kind of changed. That's kind of because that's not so much a thing. They don't. They've now they've switched over to trans. So if you're trans, you've got more victim status than somebody who's gay. Yeah. So this this thing they create is all these people. That's apparently I've, I I kept hearing this word intersection on to find out what does it mean, and it's 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 literally like playing um, the wrong word really, but that's what they call them. And it top trump cards with with victimhood. Mm. So you could be if you're if you're a woman you're oppressed, but if you're a black woman you're more oppressed. But if you're a gay black woman you're more oppressed. But if you're a trans man you're more oppressed. Right. So this level and what and this level in it is how much you get to speak or not speak. Yeah, I saw, that, you just... I saw that on the um, on the BL on the BLM manifesto. One of the things it said was, uh, "We, we, we, we have solidarity with trans people," and it just it just struck me as weird because it's like, why is that on the BLM manifesto? Black trans people, you're higher up if you're black trans. And what's that all so about? They also said they also said they wanted to destroy heteronormality. I think it's heteronormative heteronormative relationships, which is why they're trying to educate little children um using drag queens yeah so you've got this sexualization of children at a young age which traumatizes them you know it's like wearing a mask same deal you know? i've uh, i've seen a bit of that actually yeah like kind of just strange um sort of sexual stuff being taught to uh youngsters yep. and, and yeah, is, that, is that is this is this just coming in recently nope it's been going on for a long time Especially in America, they've got a website. It's drag drag queens for short stories. I think it's called. Um, they send drag queens into schools and uh, get to teach little kids. There's a bit of video in England of a of a drag queen uh, showing eight year old children how to twerk. Yeah, okay? and that's not right. It doesn't matter what religion you are or are not. And that's what caused that contra one of the controversies in Birmingham was because of stuff like that. Mm. Yeah. But why so is that? Why is this happening though? I haven't read Revelations, but I believe in Revelations when the end times come, you cannot tell the difference between men and women. I've heard so, David Icke say something about that, actually, like they, yeah, how they want to it, get rid of men and, it, men and women. Yes, they do. Yeah, they want, well, somebody said they wanted to basically create a race of hermaphrodite, which yeah. is what trans is, really. That's, you know. If people feel that they're in the wrong body, that's none of my business. It's their business. And if they want to self-identify um, as, as a sex different to their body, good luck to you, mate. Is a, 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 it's your right to do that, and B, it's none of my business.
But that's not what it's about. That's the foot in the door. The foot in the door says, we must not discriminate against transgender people. Okay, my hands go up. Absolutely agree with it. We shouldn't. Shouldn't we discriminate against anybody? But that's when it starts. And then it starts to move. And now suddenly, you can't say this, you can't say that, you can't have this opinion, you can't have that opinion. If you're a parent and you don't like what's being taught to your kids at school, then, then, then you're a bigot and, and, and you're, 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 you, you are anti, you're, you're, you're a transphobic. Uh, and the whole thing expands from the initial, we mustn't discriminate against uh, uh, transgender people. And now we have this uh, situation now where if you argue against um, toilets for boys, uh, uh, girls or anybody in a school, where, where the girls um, uh, at the school are, are kind of intimidated and don't like it, well, you're kind of transphobic. Now, this is what, this is what happens when, when the agenda kicks in. And we, haven't got, we won't have time to go in, into it now, but I go into it in the books, particularly my last book, about what this transgender uh, agenda is really about. And it's nothing, absolutely nothing to do with stopping discrimination against transgender people, nothing. Um, so you've got a whole, uh, and it, and it's a really cruel exploitation of a lot of people who are uh, confused with their own mind, you know. So gender dysphoria is the same as as, as uh, body dysphoria, mm. you know. And people who have body dysphoria uh, usually turn to things like anorexia, mm. but you wouldn't tell an anorexic person to sew their mouth up, would you, to, to finish the job? You wouldn't do that, you know. Well, it's very easy to unbalance people. Look at what people are getting put into them now. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this it's is it's the what... same principle. If you, if you, sorry, if you give sweets to little kids, right? The sugar rush makes them run around like crazy. Mm. Right now, when I worked at HMV in two thousand and seven, they decided to bring in a new customer service policy, laughingly called Loose Fit, because whoever the executive that thought of this had grown up in the late eighties, early nineties, and was a Happy Mondays fan, because mm. Loose Fit's a Happy Mondays song. Mm. ironically it starts off with a joint mm. being smoked and the the training thing before they showed the video of how how people do things wrong and how they could do it right they handed sweets out to people right and i wouldn't take one because i realized what they do is they give you the sweet the, the the sugar gives you a serotonin hit which means when they start telling you how you're supposed to tr d deal with people you won't disagree with it so it's they were literally using mind control without knowing it I found the book, the manual that the, the, the assistant manager had that told them, hey, this is how you do the meeting. Right. It said, ask, ask question X. If nobody answers, mm. stay silent until the silence becomes so embarrassing that somebody speaks. Right. That was an HMV manual. Yep. Yeah. Uh. And the thing was, those companies, <laughs> along with a lot of other companies, this is why they like to employ graduates from university to come in at at, at assistant manager level because when you go to uni university right one verse uni verse mm -hmm. there's one way of thinking yeah. when you go there you learn yeah. how to ingest information and spit it out and you get your degree you mm -hmm. don't learn how to criticize it or think about it you don't question mm -hmm. it. and these people are the same they go in as managers and they get told this is tell them to do this and tell them they never question anything and when i did do that they tried to sack me they tried to cite so you when you when you questioned do it. something that was fraudulent that they were doing to people. Yeah, when I refused to do it, they brought in. Um, oh God, they used to. They, at one point, they used to give away gift token books to people at Christmas to customers, and they were good value. You'd, you'd get hundred quid off of different stuff over a year if you were loyal, right? So mm, it's a trade off. Mm -hmm. Then they got rid of it, and people said, "Oh, what happened to that?" Because they were being run by people that wanted to save money. So they invented a store card, right? Now all the store cards you get offered in these shops. For you know, spend with us and da da da. Really, it's it's data harvesting. That's what they do. They collect your information and they sell it on, right? Mm -hmm. But most most all stores will give you a store card. HMB didn't do that. They were selling them for three pounds because that was the idea was to make money. And they told staff initially, "There's no pressure. This is the new card. Here's the T-shirt. Tell everyone we've got a store card. It's brilliant. You can get points and get this and this." And it was garbage. The, the prizes were garbage. There was no value in it. Right. So they started off in the first week. They, oh, we, we, we sold 400 this week. That's brilliant. That, made, that means they made 1,200 pounds. Right. Next week, they started giving targets. 
Then they started telling staff, you've got to sell one a day. If you don't, you'll have a disciplinary hearing, All right? Which you can't do that. And I told them, I'm not doing this. I'm not selling this. It's crap. Mm. You know? mm. I'm not going to lie to people. But if you come in a music shop and I lie to you, you'll never trust my advice on music. Mm. Yeah? And then they tried to sack me over it. So then I wait and then I quit eventually. And then a year mm. later, they changed it. But they sold a million of those, Tommy. That's three million pounds, mm. right? The guy that was running the company got a Christmas bonus of half a million. Right. And they got their Christmas party cancelled. They got their Christmas party cancelled? Yeah, the, the staff party that we used to have got cancelled because they couldn't afford it, apparently. But they'd made three million pounds of staff being afraid because most of the people I was working with were young people in the music business. Right. Mm. They were all in bands. This is how I got into photography in the first place. Right, right. So I worked with people who were young singer songwriters in bands, dancers, whatever you want to, you know, they were all trying to do their little thing on the side, but they love music. So you end up in, you, you, you grab gravitate to HMV because you're still involved in it, mm-hmm. right? You're still yeah. involved. You play music, you watch films or you can do that. And you, you've got, you know, people who are interested in the same thing, mm-hmm. you know? but they didn't know about industrial law or you, they can't, you know, you can't be pressured to do this. They can't tell you, but people are young. They don't, they're, they're afraid to lose their job. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're using behavioural psychology. And that's how these things work, is this, to a degree, yes. Yes. Mm. So uh, the, 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 the ultimate one is the story of the crucifixion, right? So the, the crucifixion ha- crucifixion also happened to Horus, right? It was the son of Isis and um, what's his name? Osiris, yeah? Mm-hmm. Horus. Yeah, now crucifixion. He's crucified. Jesus crucified between two criminals. Okay, so the analogy apparently is it's the two criminals are regret for the past and fear of the future. Mm-hmm. Yes, if you have these things in your mind, you're crucified. You don't live in the present. Okay, yeah? that's that's the analogy. And everything we've got now, all of this, oh, they're gonna, all the, they'll send you to prison. It's all fear, fear of the future, fear of this, right? Mm-hmm. And that stops people living. Um, and they know it. That's to, Behavioral psychology is everywhere. And yeah. most people who are doing it, they don't know mm. they're doing it. They really don't. I mean, a, a, the classic one was at the end of this video, when we got shown this stupid video, they gave it, they sent a, a, a post-it note and said, everybody take a post-it note, write your name, and write down one thing you're going to do different now that you've seen this video of how to do customer service mm-hmm. and i i wrote nothing i've been doing this for 20 years never come, i've got no comeback on it what are you going to tell me you're going to tell me how to do customer service in music when i've been doing it for 20 years <laughs> yeah. it's garbage it was because they were they were like these other shops they were then employing people who were shop minded not music minded mm. when you go into a music shop you want somebody with a little bit of knowledge or Someone who's empathetic to the music that you're buying, you know, right, right. or who's in, you know, who re- who's in, who realizes you have a passion for this, or you're a collector, or whatever it is. So you, you worked know? in not record... somebody who's just... you worked in record stores for uh, over twenty years. Accumulatively, yeah, I started off in our price in the late eighties. Oh, our price. how old are you now? In your forties now, isn't you? <laughs> Fifty-five. Fifty-five. Wow. Okay. Um, uh, yeah. yeah. It's a ways back. <laughs> Uh, 55. Right. Still got more hair than me. Um, but, uh, why don't you, how, do you not work in, uh, in record sh- shops anymore though? Well, the HMV was the last one at that, at that point was when, um, you could kind of see that, uh, uh downloading was on the rise and most record, I mean, a lot of little shops had gone and it kind of went down and down and down. Excuse me. But, um, they, I'd got rid of a lot of vinyl there. And I, my old boss was right about vinyl. And I always stuck to it and said, this is vinyl will be the last format mm. available. And then uh, what I should have done, because actually so, you talk about the universe. I was having my lunch out in, in near, um, oh, not Barclay Square, the other one's where the American, at Grosvenor Square one day. I was walking around, it was a sunny day. And there was somebody doing a little photo shoot and it was Theo Perfit. Yes, you know the guy from Dragon's Den. Yeah, Theo. Theo and I should have gone up to him and said, "Look, do you want to do you want to make some money? Let's open a record shop." 
when I at that point, I always told people if I had the money, I would open a record shop that I worked with. They said, oh, they all said, you're mad. Ten years later, when vinyl is booming again, they all said, why didn't you open a record shop? I said, I told you, I didn't have the money. Right. Oh, so you could have yeah. done that in but London. Vinyl is now it's this big collectible. Business. Yeah, if I'd had the, if I had had some backing, yeah, mm. yeah, you would have cornered the market. You know, but but you, we- you work for companies. When I worked in this HMV in the classical, and the classical vinyl was the first vinyl that started to come back. Right. So the the the, the, the history of formats with music is when the CD was invented, it was got nothing to do with music. It's about information, right? Mm-hmm. And then somebody said, if we can convert music into ones and zeros, we could store it on these discs and sell it. So that's what they did. Mm-hmm. So it's not a perfect format. Yeah. So then CDs got really big and vinyl went away to some extent. Mm. You know? But it was always a better sound. So it was going to come back. And then these other formats came along and, you know, got bigger and got smaller and got bigger and then disappeared again. You know? mm-hmm. so I had a mint. It was mi- an interesting. Mini discs were around for a very short period, but then they disappeared, didn't they? Mini discs. That was, that was part. Well, what happened is a guy told me this years ago. You, if you go back to like the sixties, the record companies were mostly run by people who didn't know much about music. It's a very famous Frank Zappa story where he said after Woodstock and the hippie thing, these record companies started to employ these hippies as T boys, and they would work their way up. And so when they got to be in the position of power, they would say, I know what the people want. Whereas these other companies, when they were run by these executive types, say like EMI, they would find these bands. Oh, the, the, the kids seem to be listening to this. They would get these bands and try them out. Yeah. And you, you see so sign Pink Floyd and they have a few years of being whatever. And then they have one of the biggest albums of all time. You're like, OK, well, let's use some of that money. Well, what's your name? Queen. All right, we'll sign you. We'll give them a chance. Right. Oh, well, I've got, still got some money. Oh, Radiohead. Right. People take a chance, but they don't know. Everything becomes this funneled thing. Mm. And that's what happened with the music, with music formats, is the hardware companies that make the disc said, if we buy the, them, them guys, the software, the music, we can make people buy a new format every 10 years, I think, or five years. So the idea was they brought out CDs. Oh, it's amazing. Perfect. They last forever. Not true. <laughs> CDs don't last forever, right? Oh. Um, then they bring out mini discs. Which the reason that failed is Warners didn't sign up to it. They also brought out a thing called a digital compact cassette. There was a CDVs, so CDs with video and music on it. That never, none of these things worked, mm-hmm. right? They were supposed to bring out, they started bringing out CD singles on mini little CD singles. I think I've got one somewhere. Where is it? Prince, yeah? So that's a 12 inch. They even made players for these. Again. Mm-hmm. Nice, but, uh, you know, a failure because CDs don't last very long. Mm. And so what happened is they stopped investing in the music. Mm. So when they sign an artist now, if you don't have a hit or a hit album, you're, you're done. You're done. They sign you to the and next one and next one and next one. And then they, they, there's, some, there's loads of really dodgy shenanigans. I mean, when um, – what's her name? Is it Katie? What's her name? Katie Allen. When she came out. With their album, somebody told me that they, 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 there was an, at the same time, you suddenly get a lot of artists who are very similar. So, like, Adele came out on the back of Amy Winehouse, mm. which, <laughs> which would have broken her legs. But anyway, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> Never thought I'd kill someone like you. Um, these record companies, instead of trying to be different, they go and sign somebody similar. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's why you get so the rap thing and the pop, whatever, they all sound the same. And it, it's, it comes smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller. And so there's not really much. And the, and the, the music that they're making isn't that memorable. Mm-hmm. Do you know what I mean? Well, I like I mean, that somebody what... said once that when Oasis, the reason Oasis were big is because the other. Band... Oh, sorry. Oh, I just said I like Amy Winehouse. You get into Satanism? Sorry? Sorry, say that again? Do you want to get into Satanism? What, me- Do you want to me- get into Satanism? That we're talking about Amy Winehouse. Oh, oh, why is, there a link, is Amy Winehouse linked to Satanism in some way? Did she die at 27? Uh, so what, what, why, what, what do you think happened to Amy Winehouse? Oh. you think she wasn't suicide? Yeah. No, I don't think so. No, no, no. But she was, she was definitely drinking and, and, and taking a lot of heroin, so it, it, it wasn't a massive, massive surprise. Yeah, no, she- yeah, you know, somebody somewhere along the line, people let her down. 
but she did have a handler. So, well, so you, you think she was she was killed? Yeah, because a lot of people said that she was clean about for about two weeks before whatever happened to her happened. You know, a lot of people die at twenty seven, dude, in the music business. A lot. I know, I, I feel way like more that, statistically. I, I didn't. I just didn't see any suspicious stuff going on. I didn't see any videos about her that being a, the case, and you know. I think with Chester Bennington, it, it, that looked dodgy, but I didn't. I just didn't see anything going on with with Amy Winehouse. Yeah. Yes, yes, well, him and um, what's his name, the poor fellow from Soundgarden as well. Um, yeah, Cor- Chris Cornell, is it? I his name. Chris Cornell, yeah, yeah. So yeah, but, well, they were making a they were making an expose documentary, weren't they? So you know, but you can't you can't do that, can you? If Jeffrey Epstein's involved somewhere, it's not going to end well, is it? No. Um, let, let me just get uh, I want because I definitely want to cover something before the time runs out. Amazingly, we've been going for an hour and forty. That's amazing, isn't it? And that's only this part. <laughs> we could pro- we could probably do like a ten hour video, but um. So I just wanted. To- yeah, we can do. We can do more. We can do more. <laughs> I just wanted to talk about um, the food shortages and the and what you what you think is going to happen over the next six months to a year because I actually today. And yesterday, I I, I did do a sh- uh, online shop of of stuff, and I I never would have thought I'd ever do that, but because in the BBC they started to talk about food shortages, I was like, oh my god, the BBC is actually talking about food shortages now after six months of everyone, all the conspiracy theorists it, talking about it. So I was just it's like, an think- odd, one, an odd one because of uh, um, somebody I know was do- doing media work. Um, for one of the big supermarkets. And I told them this three, four months ago that this might happen. And he said, well, actually, most of the major supermarkets have been stockpiling because of Brexit. So there is a, an odd, not a disconnect, but it's like, well, hold on. If they've been stockpiling for Brexit, you know, why? And uh, somebody was saying that a lot of the shortages are actually out in rural areas. If you go to communities, their supermarkets will have quite a few out of stock signs and empty shelves. You know, um, it's uh, it's strange because I said something the other day. I went up to so near me, the, the big place to go to is is a there's a Waitrose in Westfield, right in the shopping centre. And I noticed recently there were a couple of things that were running low, but they've been kind of. The shelves have never been stacked right back since the beginning of this. That's never, they've never been, you know, oh, oh, a, a massive abundance or whatever, but right. they're still doing deals on things. None of their prices have gone up. Um, the one thing I did notice, funny enough, considering it's, when is it? Last week, this week it started, wasn't it? No, last week. Um, they removed all of their social distancing stickers from the floors and the walls. Well, is this your, this, this is your local supermarket? Because, yeah, big waitrose. And I find that odd because they and people say, oh, but, the, you know, there's not going to be more lockdown. I said, well, we thought that after the first lockdown, but none of these places ever moved any of their stickers because they must have known it's going to happen again. There's no point. So unless they're going to put brand new ones down, maybe they're going another direction with this. Maybe it will be environmental i don't know you look at all the floods that are going on you know they're clearly messing with the weather clearly messing with the weather you know um i i I don't know like i said that's what i was going to say before is in my cellar i've got a couple of plastic containers with lots and lots of kidney beans from 2012 so the mayans got that wrong didn't they in your cellar you've got some kidney beans yeah, oh, yeah, from tw- yeah, pack of dry food from 2012 because that, that 2012 was meant to be the mine calendar end, and everything was meant to go to pot, wasn't it? So you did some stockpiling. And it never did. You did some stockpiling in 2012. Yeah. Okay. Uh, like, just like, um, like, because how how much would you recommend, like, for a single guy like I me have, to be stockpiling? I, I have no. Honestly, I have no idea. It depends a little bit. What do you, you know? Do we think is going to happen? Don't know. What. You know. I mean, ironically, how can there be food shortages if people die from the vaccine? That's a very good point. They haven't, That's thought, a very they good haven't point. thought this out, really, have they? And this is why, <laughs> you see, this is why, like, at the moment, I, I've never been in such a confusing situation, right? Because yeah. if, if, if you believe the if you believe the mainstream news, right, yeah. you, you basically wouldn't be doing anything. 
uh, in terms of you just you think everything's going back to normal pretty soon. If, um, if you believe the conspiracy websites, you'd be moving to the country, uh, maybe yeah. uh, getting a garage full of uh, full, full of, of food. Bitcoin. And and the thing is, I don't know what's going to happen. So like, I, I like I've actually got a, a couple of weeks off work at the moment because I refuse to wear a mask at work. Uh, because okay. actually, I, I, I I'm ex- I'm I'm I am ex- I'm exempt technically. Why well, did uh, you to suddenly you suddenly got to wear one then? Because they just they brought the masks back on Freedom Day because there was some kind of a rise in infections in the factory. But um, I I just I uh, they, they weren't they weren't doing it before that, and uh, and so I think I just re- I'd, I reached my point where I was like, well, I'm I'm not going to wear one, so I, I'm going to get an exemption and go back. But I've got like a couple of weeks to think about where I want to live over the next two years, and, and mm. I've just been thinking about it and. I just I find it very hard to make a, a choice because well, part of, yeah yeah we've talked about this I think I think to to really depending on what happens there may be there may be nowhere to go right yeah, that's the yeah. thing yeah and and unless you've got you know the skills or whatever I think I said I, I right at the very beginning of this I had a, a, a a, a very long Facebook argument with a friend of mine who lived down on the coast, guy I used to be at school with. Mm. And, and I said, Oh, this is going to be bad. And it's going to be this. And da, da, da. he goes, no, there's going to be good things and bad things that come out of this. And I said, what are the good things? He said, I don't know yet. Which is a pretty silly argument right now. This guy, I don't know if he had it planned, but he, him and his partner um, relocated to the East coast of Spain. They're in a little town somewhere. Oh, right. And they bought a property and they're doing okay. And they send lovely pictures in the winter of them sitting in 20 degrees. And, you know, they built a swimming pool and blah, blah, blah. And they're in a, they're in a, what would be deemed, I suppose, a better place. However, if, if, you know, if the shit hits the fan and you're in a little, t- little town somewhere, do these guys know how to grow all their own food? Mm-hmm. You know, you don't know. I mean, a lot of similarities have been made with what's happening to the way it happened at the end of the Roman Empire. So the end of the Roman Empire is very decadent, mm. very decadent. That's what you've got now. You've got decadence and, and you know, people, with, you know, champagne and cars and blah, 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 and on crazy sexuality. So I don't know if you've heard recently that um, LGBTQ, there's another group that wants to be in there. It's Z for zoo. This is people who fuck animals, right? They want to be included in there. Really? Okay. Yep. No, this is a real thing. And that's what that's what they want. They, the, the whole point of LGBT is the wedge to get the P in there. They want paedophilia as a disorder, not as a crime. Right, right. And this is I was going to say before when I was talking about charities and that Oxfam got in trouble recently. They did a they did a, a, a training video for people to reduce their whiteness. But one of the taglines they had was love is love, which comes from paedophilia. So in paedophilia, they will say, who are you to tell me I can't love this eight-year-old boy? Right? Mm-hmm. They call it love, but it's obviously not. Mm-hmm. But that's what they use. That's the phrase. So when you see this phrase, it's age consent down and down and down, right? And, mm-hmm. and having children transition, which is really evil. Really, you know, telling people to cut, mutilate their bodies. You're not, you're not old enough to decide. You're really not. Now, if you start to become feminized and then somebody offers you a reason why, oh, you're this, it's not, oh, no, you're confused. You are, you're a woman in a man's body and, oh, have these drugs, have these surgeries. Uh-huh. Yeah? You don't know. If you don't know that's a thing, you know, it's the same as, oh, we're getting to very gross land. Because so many women flush their tampons down the toilet, the estrogen from their blood cannot be removed by the filters at the filtering stations. So the water supply has extra estrogen in it. Yeah? It can't, be, it can't, can't be removed. No. No. There's an example, I believe, in America of a lake somewhere where there's some little town were flushing their, their, all their toilets it's straight into the lake. And they've discovered all the crocodiles, all the alligators, sorry, in this lake. 90% of them are female, and the 10% that are male have smaller than average penises. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if there's any, <laughs> any alligators around here, just saying. But, you know, um, so you get this, these effects, and people don't realize you put stuff in the food, it affects people. You put stuff in the water, 
it affects people. Put stuff in the air, it affects people. You don't know what's, you know, what's happening. Same with the swabs, with this gel on it, and it's got stuff in it, and who knows? Yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, a, I've got a water distiller recently because of that. But I don't oh, know how, yeah, that... I'm thinking about getting that one of those. But, but... The thing about stuff like. You can't get estrogen gen- out of just because you, of that, can you? Because they can't even do it at the fucking water distillery. Uh, when you say when you say distiller, is it an electric one, like a steamer type thing, or it's just electric, a, electric? Electric. Yeah. Okay. I, I think about getting one of those. You know, I, you, I, you may be able to get. Well, I think maybe if you use a distiller and it turns it into steam, maybe that maybe you pull the estrogen out of it. You know, but if you if you've got this happening to a population. If you look at America and look at all those, you know, simp boys, lefty, you know, all the protesting idiots and whatever, mm-hmm. they're, they're, they're all, they're, they're not, it's, they're effeminate, but they're not gay. Mm. The American army years ago were working on a gay bomb. Did you know that? No. They were working on a bomb that ex- exploded and put some chemical out that made all the opposing soldiers gay and fuck each other so they could invade them. Real <laughs> story. Uh, Real story. Is that, is that on you? Is that on YouTube? They'll, they'll, um, I've, yeah, I think if you go and look for gay bomb, you'll find something. In the long history of war, it may have been one of the craziest, downright laughable ideas: a so-called gay bomb. The idea was that um, if soldiers suddenly all became um, irresistible to one another that unit morale and cohesion would would break down and the enemy would be unable to resist. The idea of a non-lethal chemical bomb containing aphrodisiacs was among nearly 200 proposals the Pentagon received in 1994, this one from an Air Force lab in Ohio. It pitched what it called a distasteful but completely non-lethal example, especially if the chemical also caused homosexual behavior. The Defense Department says it had all the ideas reviewed, and that the gay bomb proposal was among those not making the cut. The Pentagon released a statement saying it never investigated the concept. It was just one individual putting together a concept paper with a variety of examples that were rejected. But members of the California watchdog group Sunshine Project don't buy that. When the Pentagon says that they rejected this proposal, it's simply not true, and, and we have the facts to demonstrate that they've continued to think about it and to consider it in the years since it was first raised. In San Francisco's Castro district, the idea of a gay bomb, whether considered or not, was good for some laughs. Do they really think that, like, <laughs> faced with, like, guns and, like, being killed, they're really going to choose sex? People still have such a misunderstanding of sexuality in general, not just homosexuality, but sexuality in general, that they think that it could be used as a weapon. Like, when when has that ever worked? Sagar Megani, The Associated Press, Washington. Look, look at that film, The Men Who Stare at Goats. They worked on that, too, remote viewing, right? Which is also a thing. There are people who can do that, you know? Yeah, I heard about that. I never, yeah, read, I never read the were, book, The Men Who Stare at Goats. They've been trying to to replicate um, oxytocin, and oxytocin is is the chemical that your brain produces. It happens to people when they have children. It's why people love their kids for the first two years and don't kill them. It's because of oxytocin. It's this chemical that makes you oh, oh god, oh, it's fantastic. like when you meet someone yeah. falling in love is a chemical reaction. Mm. It's a chemical reaction. Mm. And so this, they, if they can replicate that, they want to give it to everyone. Now, what do the World Economic Forum say? By 2030, you'll own nothing and be happy. Yeah. You'll be happy. Just, just take this injection. You'll be happy. We just switch that bit of your brain old off. He's a very uh, interesting character. So yeah. how, how, would, Again, how, would they sw- how would they switch the brain off? Uh, well, if they're injecting people with stuff that affects the DNA, these RNA vaccines go and give messages to the DNA. So right. the theory of these vaccines is this thing goes into your DNA and makes it produce the virus so your body can produce antibodies for it. That's the idea. Normally with a vaccine, they give you a, a, a light version of the actual virus. Your body responds. When the real thing comes along, you fight it. Yeah. Uh-huh. But this thing is making your body produce it. It's the same as Monsanto when they were producing these uh, seeds, these plants that produce their own pesticide. 
Now, would you eat a plant that produces its own chemical pesticide? No. No, but I have been. What's it called? Glyphosate? Glyphosate? Glyphosate. That's been causing birth defects, you know. Mm-hmm. So these companies are just about making money. They're not, they don't care about people. You know, yeah. these, you know anybody, anybody that the government cares about them is really missing the point. Um, you know, I uh, I, def- I definitely accepted that the government um, I do uh, don't care about us. I accepted that quite a while ago. What I don't understand is why the um, the people who are kind of the pol- the politicians and the advisors and stuff why they're all going along with it. Um, I I haven't, well, I, haven't the, I haven't quite got, get, got that sense of why that's happening. Well, the people who get elected are. Just- just they're, they're not there for a long time, but the civil service is there all the time. I never watched it, but Yes Minister is the one of the most truthful shows ever. The civil service are like the engine room and the, and the rudder of a ship, a big ship, right? They're controlling how fast it's going and where it goes. And the captain is like the government. They're on the top saying, well, we want to go there. And they're like, well, no. You know? So governments will try and do stuff, but civil service can scupper that. You know, they've been doing that for a long time. If they don't really like something and you've got people in these organizations who've been through the 20 years of, of Blairite education systems. So when Tony Blair got in, that's when they started changing the education system. So they got rid of they changed sports days so that they, everyone gets a trophy for participating, not winning. Right, but that's right. not what life is like. You need to learn to learn to lose and win. If you go for a job and there's 10 of you, nine of you ain't going to get the job. Yeah. Now, if you're one of these SJWs, you're going to throw a tantrum and say, you, it's because I'm a, I'm a girl or I'm a whatever, you, you victimize me. And it's not. You just weren't good enough. Yeah, yeah? Yeah, yeah, but they, yeah. don't, they haven't been teaching yeah. that. And then, you, then they start teaching all this other stuff. And if you look at schools now, most of the teachers are women in their 20s, right? Yeah. And when you go, if you look at a BLM march, it's mostly women in their twenties <laughs> trying to get back at daddy somehow, you know. And you and you get this, so they've got rid of of proper ma- masculine role models in these schools. They got rid of that. Yeah, yeah. And when I, that, I, when I, the school I went to was all, all boys. You know, I, I was noticing that at the um, I went to the Leeds protest on Saturday, and uh, like the police. It, it, they were really trying to like uh, not not allow us to walk down certain roads and stuff for absolutely no reason. Shame on you! 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 And it was like, it like, I realised at that moment it's like this needs like loads of alpha males here because it's like. Like I can, I I can get a, a bit involved, but it's like it's like that's what it's got. That, that's the point that it's got to now because it's like it's like, like it's, the, pol- the police are like literally blocking the the roads and they're harassing people and they're arresting like women, uh, and they're just doing it because the state are telling them to. But that if there was a there was a, if there was a yeah. lot there was a lot more like um, yeah real alpha males who could get right up in people's faces like it it would it would be it would help a lot. So I can see why that that might be an agenda too. Yeah, or or if that, uh, I think that's well, that, that's meant to be one of the tactics, isn't it? If, if the idea is if they if they start pulling women out of the crowd, that the men will react, and then they can justify violence after that. That's the psychology of it. So they pick on women so that men will come to defend them. What's she been arrested for, officer? Now you can hear us. What's she been arrested for? What's she been charged with? I've got one later. Look, she's been charged with now. We've got no cameras in prison. What charge has she been on? What's she been charged with? Stay back or I will kick you! 
And what do you think of policing in the UK now? Well, we we were there speaking with the officers. They asked us to move out the space on the street. Then the officers formed like a triangle, like, like an arrowhead. Three officers behind each other pushing me, my girlfriend here, and someone else over. They fell on the floor. I fell back. And they arrested my girlfriend here. I always remember standing there in the road, standing there in the road, doing nothing. Behind the line, the police officers asked us to move. We said no. We're not, we're not committing no crime. And they were pushing us. We were standing somewhere, so pushing, pushing. We were asking them to stop touching us. And they formed, they formed a group around us and pushed us over. I can see what's happened to your shirt there. Yeah, that's, that's another. Yeah, but I can charge him for that, I suppose, if he really wants to. And what do you think needs to happen to people who are complicit in the crimes that are being witnessed? I believe they've got to be held personally accountable. Held personally accountable, because no matter what uniform you wear, no matter what uniform you, wear, you, you guys wear, and what umbrella you fall under, you're still human beings in socks. You're human beings in socks. You've got your own conscience, your own spirit, and your own, your own sense of right from wrong. You know us people here, we're, we're gathering peacefully, not committing no damage to anyone, not committing no crime, most of all. What crime are we what crime are we committing today? Someone asked me, what crime has anyone there committed today? Can you answer that? Can, can, can you tell me what crime someone has committed today? I can tell you this, I've got this whole way. I can't hear you. I'm shutting off the highway. Isn't that what the G7 did in Cornwall? There was a, there was a protest, right? An organised protest from 10 to 12. After that time, it was deemed that you were now unlawfully obstructing the highway. Okay? So 1300 it was deemed that you were unlawfully obstructing the highway. So we have engaged with people to try to move them away from the highway, however they are not moving the highway. So therefore, it's obstruction of the highway. Because you're still obstructing the highway, causing a mad major disruption to London. Okay? Do you believe that you've achieved your targets by grabbing this small girl? I don't know what she's been arrested for. Okay? But do, do, you, do you believe that this is making the country safer? Where is it? Is this making the country a safer place, sir? Yeah. 